Hello and welcome to this episode of The Inner Booters, a podcast all about people who have a connection with Aberdeen and the northeast of Scotland. And we've tried to find out a little bit more about their story, their journey and their connection to this part of the world. And as always on the podcast, we ask our guests to introduce themselves. So over to you. Tell us who you are, what you do and who you do it for. Hello, I'm uh, Chris Cusseter and I'm uh, an Aberdonian. I uh, left Aberdeen in the year 2000 and Became eventually a professional rugby player, uh, played all over the world, uh, lived in France, England. Um, and then when I could no longer do that, I moved to California and I'm in the Scotch whiskey business, uh, currently with a company called Alexander Murray and Co. Um, and we do a lot of private label business over here in the US, um, based in California. We work with Costco, Trader Joe's, Total Wine, some of the big chains out here. Uh, which is perfect because it allows me to get back to the, the homeland uh, a few times a year um, and allows me to, to live over here in the sunshine. So, yeah. Fantastic. And that and that ability to have a journey and a trip back and reconnect with Aberdeen in the northeast of Scotland, do you do you feel that's important? Is that something that you look forward to? And does it regenerate you? What, what do, how do you feel about that? Yeah, it, it really does. I, I, you know, I know you know, I'm pals with a few Scots over here, and I think he, it probably makes us more patriotic, ironically, by by being away. And you know, we we miss you know, certainly. I miss all the the great aspects of home. And you know, I, I love living here, and I, I I do enjoy you know the outdoors kind of lifestyle and the weather and everything. But you know, if you grew up in Scotland, you have obviously an affinity with with the people and it's it's that it's a sense of humor and the the kind of the dry you know sense of humor i think that we have that is is quite unique and the americans mm. certainly don't get it they think we're that we're really mm. mean so <laughs> i enjoy coming back and getting slagged off by my pals and um you know just kind of reconnecting and, and i think working in the whiskey business as well it's it, it feels meaningful to me because it's it's something that we're world class at you know we produce the best whiskey in the world um it's, it's revered around the world certainly in the, in the united states so you know, it makes you kind of proud and, and i think it gives it meaning to be to be working in an industry like that um and obviously you know i, I do get back two or three times a year to to meet with uh you know some of our, our partners over there so for me right now it's, it's really the, the perfect kind of balance um the other thing i've realized is that you know i've kind of gone into golf in, in the last few years and actually some of the best mm -hmm. golf courses in the world are obviously in scotland and I can't wait to get back and, and play all those courses. I lived next to and around for, you know, for well for a long time and, and never took advantage of playing. So every time I come back, it's 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 a real kind of I get real enjoyment from exploring these ancient courses that have been around for hundreds of years. And um, yeah, it's it's just a it is a fantastic place. Um, it was a fantastic place to grow up, um, and it's a great place to come back and visit. And for me right now, it's the the kind of perfect balance. And, and and what you said there, you're still coming back after. I mean, it it doesn't seem like uh, 2000 when you left Aberdeen, or and, and we'll get to that sort of journey in a second. But you're still coming back to the region and enjoying it, but in a new wave, in a different way now, because you've discovered something else that the region has to offer, such as golf. But it, it's still fresh for you. Yeah, it is. Yeah, I, I suppose you feel more like a, a tourist, you know. But I, I've still got pals that are in Aberdeen that. You know, have have always been there and, and have a great life in Aberdeen. My mum is still in Aberdeen, lives out in, in Mill Timber. So, you know, that, that part of the world is absolutely beautiful, especially in the summer when you come back and you get mm. a nice day out in out in you know in D side. It's absolutely beautiful. Um so no, I've I've got a strong affinity with it. I always will have. Um you know, I, I don't know whether I'll, I'll live there again, but it, it's it doesn't really matter to me. It's um, you know, I I had a great upbringing there I have really fond memories of growing up there and you know in the town in Aberdeen in the West End and you know all the parks nearby and being able to walk into town and um you know like I say in the golf courses and all that I just you know like world class so it's um no it's, it's got a lot going for it I think you know I, I moved to Edinburgh uh for university and then I lived in Glasgow latterly when I was playing rugby and you know they're they are great they're great cities no doubt and I mm -hmm. suppose on, on reflection they, they they have a bit more in terms of um, kind of creative culture and, and concerts and shows and, and and cafes and that kind of thing. But, you know, I think Aberdeen has evolved quite a lot, actually, since I left. Now I left a long time ago, 24 years ago, but it's uh, it's definitely evolved. And, 
you know, I know a lot of folk who are running, you know, local businesses and, mm-hmm. you know, who, who do a great job. You know, there's, there's, there's money in Aberdeen and, you know, folk are always looking for, for good quality, you know, businesses and, and services to support. Um, and I think, I think the Aberdeen folk are, are resourceful and, and, and thrifty and good business people. And, you know, it's been shown over the last mm-hmm. kind of 34 years with the oil business in particular, but, um, you know, I, I love coming back and going for, for a pint in the Dutch mill or, um, you know, just kind of the, all the kind of institutions that are, are still going strong. And I think we'll, we'll always be there. They're still here. Absolutely. And we'll, and we'll get to the whiskey trail or journey that you, that you've, that has got you to where you're at now, but playing rugby, I mean, you're one of these few athletes globally who's got to wear a, a national team kit. I mean, it's a privilege and, you know, without being too fanboy, you know, we're into rugby as a family. So how did that progression happen? You came, you came to, came out of school, went to Edinburgh and then started playing in Glasgow and Edinburgh. And was it, were you always intent on playing for your country? Was it something you always felt you could do and you wanted to do? I, so, you know, so when I was growing up in Aberdeen, I went to Robert Gordon's, that's where I learned to play rugby. So, you know, my dad had played mm-hmm. and my dad had played for Gondorians. So he was always pushing my brother and I in that direction, you know, but growing up, I wanted to play for Aberdeen Football Club. You know, that's, that was the big <laughs> team okay. and That's You'd go to yeah. Audrey and, you know, he always, of course, wanted to go and, go and play for them. But, you know, I, I played a bit of football, but um, I think when I was 10 or something, changed school and started playing rugby. And that, you know, it was a one, a one-way street from then on. But, I, I, you know, I, I did it for fun, you know, like you're, you're, you're a kid and you're playing with your mates. And I, I love the whole you know, the, that team mm. element of it, I think, you know, the bus trips, you know, at school and you'd go down to Edinburgh and play the, the schools down there. And, it, you know, it kind of definitely planted a seed that it was something that I really enjoyed. But it was probably only when I was like 18, 19, I was like, okay, I think, you know, there's maybe a, a chance here of, of getting a professional contract, which was the, the way mm. to go. You know, you, ha- you obviously had to be professional to, to play for Scotland by that point. So, you know, I, I'd done some of the age grade stuff from, from Aberdeen. So I'd played like Scottish schools under 16s, under 18s, and then played under 19 World Cup uh, when I was at university. And I think after that, I was like, okay, I think I've got a chance of this. And to be honest, from then on, it was tunnel vision. Like, this is what I love doing. This is what I want to do. And, you know, I was studying law down at Edinburgh University, but I was kind of scraping through because I, you know, I didn't really enjoy it, you know, truth be told, but I was so focused on rugby and training and, you know all the kind of stuff around that that that's that that became my focus so i was i was definitely a wee bit i mean i got my degree but i was kind of all eggs in that basket this is what i want to do and i was all in for it and you know luckily i did get a, a, a pro contract just when i graduated university in 2003 and you know and, and it was off off from then so no it was it was it was brilliant you know i, I think if you ask a mm. any 21 year old you know would you rather go and be a trainee lawyer or do you want to go and be paid to play <laughs> rugby that's a fairly obvious choice so you know i was i was all was that a no-brainer for you at that point did you feel that 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 you put so much effort into getting yourself to that point that you were being selected and chosen it was a no-brainer yeah it's, it's all i wanted to do i was you know i was just obsessed with with rugby and with with kind of getting better and trying to get to that level where you know again a pro contract but then at that level it's like okay now mm-hmm. you know i want i want to play for scotland and that was that was my kind of my dream i'd say from when i was a kid but i, I don't think i ever really mm-hmm. thought it would be possible to be honest it was more when mm-hmm. i got to university 18 19 and i realized i've got i've got a chance of this and I, you know i'd play, I play against guys who i thought you know i think i'm better than you and i think i can i can mm-hmm. be even better you know and i i think that's maybe a wee bit what i think about being from aberdeen gave me is that you're you know, Aberdeen is, we're a small country, but you're off the beaten track and everything comes from the central yeah. bit, you know, everything revolves around, around mm-hmm. that, and particularly around Edinburgh and, and rugby back in those days. So, you know, these, you know, these big private schools in Edinburgh who produce, you know, a lot of great rugby players, but mm-hmm. it gave me a chip on my shoulder and I was like, I, th- I think mm-hmm. I'm better than you, you know, I, I think I can be better than you. And I kind of used that as, as fuel to, to train a bit harder and to, you know, I'm super competitive. Um, and I think it helped me, to be honest. I think that kind of mentality probably helped me to a, to a point. I think at some point you have to kind of try and outgrow that, but it gives you motivation. And um, I, I think for sure, you know, Aberdeen is is the third biggest city in Scotland. And, you know, we're not a big rugby playing country in, in overall like compared to New Zealand or, 
you know, these other small countries that produce an enormous amount of rugby players. So it's it's crazy and it's still kind of crazy to me that Aberdeen is not looked at closer, you know, as a, a breeding ground for uh, for rugby players who can come through, you know, boys and girls. So, you know, I, I know there's efforts going on, but I, I'm sure there's more that, that can be done. Um, but I, yeah, I, no, I would support that. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, I, th I think two boys, you know, two adult men now who uh, loved rugby going through it. They've had to work really hard, but they've went, once once they've been exposed to that level in the central belt, where they can sit there and go, "Actually, I am. I can be as good as the next guy. I, yeah. I, I can be as good as the next person." And that did motivate certainly one of them to up their game, work harder. Natural ability gets you so far, but once you get to that level, and and how did that work out? You're in you're in that pro scene now. You, you're now looking at that that next step to get into what, what what's the what's the step change between club club rugby pro scene and then you're in the international circuit i mean how much more did you find that step change quite hard in terms of work effort and input or do you, were you always working toward that at this stage uh, i i think it happened quite quick to be honest so i, I mm. think I'd, I'd started my professional contract in 2003 um mm. down in the borders and so that was well i guess the season starts in like september and then in the february the following year i was got my first cap um against wales down in, in cardiff so it was all really really quick and it, mm. it's i mean there's definitely levels to it obviously going from you know i was at borough muir the year before to the borders playing in the the celtic league it was at the time and then international and at every level it gets quicker and there's less space and people are bigger and stronger and so you just kind of mm -hmm. I suppose you adapt or you have to adapt to, to survive. Um, and it was a bit of a baptism of fire. I, I think maybe having a, a wee bit longer in the pro game before getting thrown, not thrown at the deep end, but I, I don't think I was really ready, but you know, you're not going to ever turn that down. So that was, uh, yeah, I was only 20, what was that? 21, 22, I think playing in that six nations. And, you know, it was, it was a dream come true for sure. I look back and I think those were the mm -hmm. best days because it's, it's, you know, the excitement of playing in those stadiums for the first time and in front of 80,000 people mm. and wearing the thistle. Like, that's really, really special. You know, and, and the family's there, you know, like my brother, my dad, my mum mm -hmm. are all down at the game and you know they're watching and you know they're proud. And, you know, it, it makes you really proud. And I think that the okay. hard thing about that period for Scottish rugby was that we didn't win that many games. And I think when yeah. I look back, although, of course, I'm, you know, I'm proud to have played as many times as I did and, all that it was a tough tough period so you want to win for scotland for sure you know you want people to be proud and you know the way that i you know i watch scotland now in the six nations or world cup and i'm you know it's it's brilliant the way that they play and the the results that they've been getting in general and i think um I definitely would have loved to have been part of that era um but you know i have also learned to try to focus on the positives and you know mm -hmm. that kind of uh Oh well, it could have been better. I'm actually, I'm actually done with that. I had a great time. I, I really loved playing rugby professionally. It, it allowed me to see the world, you know. And I lived in France for a couple of years, and down in uh, Manchester playing for Sale, you know, tour with the British Lions in 2005, which is like beyond what I ever thought was was possible. And you know, so I, I look back proudly for sure. It was it was a great time. Well, we'll talk about the modern game maybe just a, a little bit in a second, but. I've stepped on the pitch in Murrayfield, but it's been empty, right? So like most punters, I've I've managed to step on the pitch. How how do you come out of that tunnel with, with that top on, knowing there's 80,000 people with probably about half of them, maybe 60%, really want you to win? It, it, is it quite emotional or what sort of prep talk do you get before you enter that stage from the team? Who's, who's taking you through there? Who's mentoring you into that space? Uh, you know, we had... They would bring in, you know, ex-internationals, you know, guys who played in the 90s and they would come mm. in and chat to you about it. Um, actually, at the borders, like Gary Armstrong was still playing when I was just starting out. He was he was old. He must have been mid to late 30s by then. But, you know, mm. you had those guys around you to kind of draw, you know, the experience from. And But it, I think everything is probably elevated is how I would describe it. You know, there's so much energy mm. in the stadium through the crowd. and because of the occasion, particularly like a Six Nations game, if you're playing England, you know, you can feel that energy in the crowd. And I think it, it helps and it or it can help or it can hinder. I think that's probably the yeah. 
fair way to say, you know, you, you need an you need an element of confidence um, to be able to thrive in that environment. And if you're feeling confident and you've been playing well and the game is going well, it's it's, it's fantastic. Obviously, you know, and I I think I played in a couple I don't know, maybe 2006. I know we beat we beat England at Murrayfield, so that was you know unbelievable. And you can see how happy everyone is in the crowd. You know, that's the one game that folk want to win. So you, you can be part of that. It's it's a brilliant experience. And then you have the other side, you don't win and people are understandably disappointed, uh, maybe even angry, um, depending on how the game has gone. And, and that can be quite hard because it's a it's a burden and, and you want to, you know, you want to win the game because you're a competitor and, you know, and, and, and you want to win because you're playing for Scotland. And if you don't, it's, it can be quite hard. So there's definitely, I mean, it's highs and lows in that career. And I certainly felt that all along the way, you know, the, the, the highs are extreme highs and the, the wins and the celebrations and the partying is fantastic and the lows are, are really, really low. And you probably, I remember, I would say the, the bad games more than the than the good games, unfortunately. I think that's how our, our, how our brains are kind of wired. But I think at the end of it all, when you when I look back and I think, okay, would I, would I have taken the downs along with the ups? Then of course you would, you know, it's, that's life. I think it's, it's, it's actually a, a good metaphor for life. You know, the, you, it, it doesn't all, all go one way, you know, and you have to persevere and be resilient and be able to bounce back from bad results or whatever, and then kind of keep going. Yeah, I mean, we use the word experiment, you know, in in the office here. Go and try it. Providing nothing blows up, go and give it a try. And you will, if you experiment enough, you're going to fail more times than you win. But when it wins, it wins big time. You know, it, it does, it has that ripple effect that everybody pays attention to that positive thing. And sometimes as Aberdonians, I don't, and Scots probably, but Aberdonians, you know, you know, don't be too successful, actually, how you break the mould in that. So the, that, that chat there and the modern game now, you were sort of, at the tail end of the career, social media was sort of kicking in and you were, you know, you're quite an early user of uh, Twitter, if I remember right. At that time, you were you were posting quite a lot and you were quite avid in there. And you, you were, you were I remember you being warts and all. I remember you had a shoulder injury or so, shoulder operation and you were posting about that and how you felt about it. And it was, it was all quite an open experience going through all of that. But that's completely flipped now. You know, we've got a different Scotland team, different international teams, but the scrutiny now is every second, every, every, second of every game and then yeah. and then some how, how do you feel that would have impacted you would you just grown into it you know modern player chris walks onto the pitch now at murrayfield for a six nations with all this social media how how do you handle that noise because a lot of it is just noise isn't it yeah i think it'd be really hard for for, for those guys now particularly the, the higher profile mm. guys and and they well, it's been a, it's been a mixed bag, I suppose, for those high profile guys like Finn Russell. You would say, you know, he doesn't seem to feel mm -hmm. any pressure, and he's on social media. Mm -hmm. And I think, by and large, it would be positive. But I'm sure he gets a lot of criticism as well. That's the nature of it. Um, Stuart sure. Hogg has, has had a difficult time. You can, you know, if, mm -hmm. when you look at the, you know, what's been going on, and I think if you, if you, you know, those guys were were good young, and they were then like world class young, and they were. They are, they were some of the, and are some of the best rugby players in the world. And that is probably Scotland, something, something that Scotland didn't have so much, um, two guys mm -hmm. that high profile. So I, I think looking at them and how, you know, that's the two sides of how it can affect you. And if you find yourself making decisions based upon what you think people are going to think, or are you doing it because, well, this is what I know is right for the game or whatever, that's when it can be become really, really difficult. And, and that external pressure could distort your your way of thinking. So I, I think it's really hard. I don't I don't envy them actually. I think we were yeah, mm -hmm. social media was around, but it's nowhere near what it mm -hmm. is now. And I think the rugby players. I think it's used differently. Yeah. yeah, I think I think I think exactly what you're saying. It's used differently. I think the players who make the most of it do court that negative side of things because that's what it is. You know, it's the internet. It's, a, it's the worst It's the worst school playground in the world. I mean, it's sure. because you don't know anybody's face. But the flip of that is it's there and it's how it's used. And some of them use it very well, as, as you've said. So yeah. you, you're in that international scene. You've played in France. 
uh, you, you, you've you picked up some injuries because you're playing hard. You know, that that's it. You're, I think the game was changing at that point as well. People were getting faster and bigger. Certainly as an outsider, it seemed that way. That, that the, the same way that Tiger Woods came in as a golf athlete, he was the first, I think, first athlete to play golf. There were some really big, very fast rugby players just as you were coming through that space. And it was, there seemed to be a disconnect a little bit. Did, did, it, did you see that or is that my... Is that my unrealistic view as a punter looking into the game? People became all of a sudden, it felt all of a sudden within a four-year period, big and fast. <laughs> they always felt big and fast playing in it, but I, I think, <laughs> especially if you're my size, I'm not, I'm not yes. a big yeah. so you are competing against those, but I think it's the sports science or the conditioning that has has developed mm. a lot. And, you know, we obviously we, we did a lot of that. We lift a lot of weights. So there was a lot of... Um, conditioning going into it but i think every year as you know the kids who are in academies younger are are probably mm. bigger and stronger earlier and mm. there's no real kind of throwbacks to the amateur era or people who are able to get away with not quite being at that level um my you know i, I think my issue was i never really i was kind of fearless in a way on the pitch because you feel mm -hmm. conditioned for it and you know you're used to contact you're used to playing with big folk all the time so you just say well I'll, I'm gonna kind of give it everything and I, I had a lot of injuries by playing like that and at the time I was like well this is how I like to play and I, I'm 100% and I'm not kind of scared of that contact but it cost me a lot of years of playing rugby really you know I missed a lot of time through injuries um some unlucky you know a, a dislocated shoulder which cost me 11 months a fracture a kneecap and you know those were maybe somewhat avoidable but you're always you're gonna get knocks playing professional rugby mm -hmm. like it's just a physical game. And I, I watch it now, you know, disconnected from the game. I'm not conditioned for it, obviously. And I watch it and I'm like, this is brutal. Like the <laughs> hits. And I, I, I think it has developed. You know, I, I retired eight years ago. It's definitely developed, but it's, it's at its core, it's a, um, it's a brutal sport and it, it's, it's bone mm -hmm. on bone and it's, you know, big, strong men and women hit each other really, really hard, as hard as they can. So it, it, it it's going to hurt you. Um, it just depends. Can you avoid the big injuries? You know, can you avoid the the ACLs and the the discate shoulders and that kind of stuff? And and the head injuries and come out of it in one piece. And you know, for me, that I was never bothered about the injuries. It's, it's just was like, right, fix me up and I'll get back out there. And you know, that's just part and parcel of it. But I think looking back, I think it probably could have been a bit more canny about how I played <laughs> and. Uh, you know, it was it was just never really my way. So you know, you you live and learn. But you're smiling about it. You've got a. I mean, we have an affinity in Robert Gordon's college in Aberdeen because of my children go through there. I remember George Watson. He must have been on the go as a rugby coach when you were there. Yeah. And, and my kids affectionately called him Yoda because he was as old as Yoda. But the first training session that we were doing with the kids, he walked past the line of dads, mostly dads, unfortunately, and said, "Gentlemen, rugby is a contact sport." Uh, your children will be contacted by other children at full pelt. If you don't like that, this is not for you. And he just yeah. kept walking down the line. It was blasé. There was no statement. And that's what he did. I mean, you realize that. I mean, we got that a little bit. You could see something, but not little Johnny. He doesn't He doesn't take a hit. Sometimes little Johnny was the best one. You know, little Johnny yeah. would put his head in anywhere. It was quite exciting to see. Yeah. So we, we've talked about we've talked about the rugby bit, and, you, and you're saying eight years ago retirement. Was California on the map for you at that point? Was that a natural progression to go out there? Because you, you're now involved in that whiskey business side of things. And I'd like to learn a little bit more about that. You're, you, what, what lured you out to California? What, was it this? What, how, what took you there? Uh, it wasn't, I, I would say it wasn't a natural path to follow, to be honest. I kind of wanted it to happen because I, I just mm. really liked out here and I really wanted to have mm. the experience of living out here. And the thing about playing rugby, it was, it was, it's a great, you know, I did 13 years professionally. So from 21 to 34 and it's, it was brilliant. I loved mostly all of it, but you're, you're then 34 years old. You've never had a, a real job as it were, a traditional job. You don't have experience in anything other than playing rugby. And, you know, I tried to do bits and pieces here and there and bits of work experience and try to understand other, you know, businesses, but it's, you're like a 21 year old who's mm. had arrested development and you haven't had the chance to, to be a young guy, you know, making mistakes and kind of being forgiven for that. And, 
you know, at the time was, you know, was married, had one daughter and you've got, you know, responsibilities, things to pay for. So it's quite tough actually. And I, I don't think that mm. this would maybe only be really fully understood by folk who've, who've gone through that transition from professional sport into the real world, but it's, it's really hard because you've, you've been at that level and things are in some ways quite easy if you're at that level, you know, you, you get paid quite well and you get free things, you know, I had a, you know, a Nike sponsorship. So you're getting free clothes, you get a free car, like all that stuff is, is great. And it, when it ends, it just ends and it's, it's cut off and, and you know, it's coming and it's quite hard. So anyway, I was always on the lookout for something to do after. And I, I was always, I, I never wanted to coach. I was always interested in business <laughs> and I wanted to come and live in California. So I decided to do a, a bit of a leap of faith. They have this program out here called the EB5 uh, green card. So you invest money in a business and then you create 10 jobs and then you get a green card. So it was the only way that I could see that I could get a green card in America. So I decided to do that and I, I bought a whiskey shop out in out in Los Angeles and, and you know, moved the family out and mm -hmm. just that was it. It was like, right, we're, <laughs> we're, in, we're in this now. Uh, I suppose I better figure on, out how you, to Before that point, before that point, what did you know about retail and whiskey? Zero. Tell us. <laughs> okay. Absolutely zero. It was, it was really, it was, I was, I got here and I, I kind of was like, what have I done? This, this is the, yeah. the stupidest decision you've ever done. You should have gone back to Edinburgh and, you know, just done something gentle and learned a wee bit, but I, I kind of went all in and you know, I was committed because I'd invested the money by that point and we'd gone through the whole administrative process and we'd moved out, we'd moved all our stuff out. So it was like all in. And it was without doubt the hardest thing I've ever done and the most stressful thing I've ever mm. done for, I'd say for two years, mm. it was, it was just felt like this is really, really brutal. And then, it, you know, I, I think the other thing about it was I was, you know, I was in at the deep end, so I had no, it was sink or swim. And uh, I just thought, mm. right, I'm going to, I'm going to figure this out. And, you know, I, I knew nothing about retail. I arrived on, it was a business that I bought an existing business and we, there was two employees, I think at the time. So I get there on day one and I, I felt like a fraud, if I'm being honest, because I, I would imagine most folk that kind of start their own whiskey shop have probably worked in a whiskey shop and they've probably built up experience and they understand how a store works, but I didn't know any of that. So I felt like a fraud because I'd been able to buy this business because I'd made some money playing rugby. Now that's, that's a, that doesn't, <laughs> nobody cares. So I turned up on day one and the, one of the guys that was there, he said, oh, what would you like us to do? And I said, well, I don't know. Do you know what, what do you normally do? Uh, well, we do this and that. Okay. Well, you just keep doing that, you know, in the meantime, yeah. I'm trying to go, okay, you know, what do I need to do here? And, you know, if, and, you, and I figured it out, I think that's, that's the, the end of the story is I, I figured it out. And I think that pressure, obviously I worked more than I've ever worked in my life, you know, long hours, long days, many six or seven days a week because I, I had to, and it was tough. You know, uh, with the family, it was, you know, it was, a, it was a tough period of our lives and there was no kind of going to the beach or, you know, any of the kind of things that you'd think, oh, moving to California, it was just really, really full on, but it, it did work out and it was actually a good way, I think, of learning, just kind of getting stuck into everything and figuring it all out. And, and in the end, I, you know, I kind of I grew the business a lot. I got, I created, the, I created like 17 jobs and I think in the end, and it was, it was a good experience, but for sure the most stressful thing I've ever done. And uh, I'm glad I don't have to ever do that again. So, so did you approach that like your rugby career? You went, there's no point in going into the pitch half-assed. I'm going to, I'm going to go and play here. I've, yeah. I've bought a shop. I need to go and play now. So I'm going to make it up as I go along. I'm going to find out what hurts. And I'm, two years or three years or four years later, I'm 17 staff in and it's successful. Did it, did yeah. it did, is that a tenacity that you've always had? And is it a Northeast thing, do you think? Or is that a Chris Cusseter thing? I, th I think, yeah, I think so, actually. And I think, yeah, there are, I never really thought about that, but there probably were a lot of similarities with, you know, the way I played rugby and the way I did that. Because mm -hmm. I think when I played rugby, there was always more skillful guys, for sure. Like guys who could pass better, could kick better, you know, were quicker. Mm -hmm. There's always that. There's always someone who's, who's better at something. But I think I definitely tried really, really hard. <laughs> and I think mm -hmm. that I was... You know, mm -hmm. I gave it everything and I was fully committed. And I think, okay, well, that is my, that's what I've got. And for sure, I think that's a Northeast thing. And I, I think what I was saying earlier about the kind of chip on the shoulder, being from 
off the beaten mm-hmm. track, you know, and obviously coming out here, you know, I didn't know anything about the the competition really, to be honest, but really most of the whiskey stores or the, you know, the liquor stores are owned by the Syrian community. So, and they're very, very canny. Okay. They stick together. They help each other out. So I would have been the mm-hmm. only Scottish store owner in California probably. So, you know, that was like an underdog. Okay. I'm here. I've got no experience. And yeah, definitely gave me a, it gave me a point of difference maybe, but all I had was hard work because I didn't know anything about running a store. Mm-hmm. I had no expertise. I had no savvy. Um, it was just just hard work. So yeah, I, th- I think I would put it down to that. Um, and yeah, I think it's it's a northeast uh, trait. You know, I think it, I, I I don't think that's just me. You know, feeling like that coming from Aberdeen, maybe feeling like you're a wee bit forgotten about. Mm-hmm. You're off to, off the mm-hmm. beaten track. So why not use that as uh, you know as, as fuel to the fire? And, and like I said, I think at some point you have to try and step away from that. But it's hard if, if you've grown yeah. up like that. I think you know, yeah. especially in America, folk. If you tell folk that, oh, well, you know, we're just a, you know, a wee country or just, you know, Scottish quiet, you know, they'll believe you, you know, okay, you have to tell them mm-hmm. how good you are and what you're doing. Mm-hmm. That's the way it works here. So mm-hmm. I've, I've learned that, you know, you can't even talk yourself down. If you talk yourself down, they'll believe you. So you have to talk yourself up because yeah. they start. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. I mean, the, the, because our tech community, we know the Valley quite well and some people that are out there. In fact, Duncan Logan is one of our other podcasters. He lives in Santa Barbara, went to Aberdeen Uni and has started up Rocket Space and then Nine Zero, which is a climate tech company. The tenacity is unbelievable. You know, so I'm going to go and do this and this is how I'm going to do it and I need your help. You know, and all the time, relentless, relentless. So you, you you talked about you get to seventeen. Do you still have the whiskey shop, and has that evolved into the the, the whiskey business? Because part of what you're saying there, you've got your head down, and you've got you're grinding, you're really working hard, and then being a CEO means you can sit back a little bit from that. It's a different type of grind. It's a very lonely place. I can say that. But how, how the two interlinked? The, was there a natural evolution between the shop and and the business is called? You know, give it a plug. What's the business called that you're running now? So it's Alexander Murray and Co. is what I'm doing now. So I actually sold the the last business in 2021. So it mm. was just post COVID. COVID was actually good for the business because we were doing online alcohol sales. So the whole of California started drinking a lot. I think like everyone did around the world, <laughs> that we were very well placed to capitalize. So it just yeah. is like somebody turned on the taps and we were just, you know, almost two shifts a day so i think it was two eight hour shifts two different crews coming in packing boxes shipping orders we were just it was full on so wow. it was never going to be better it was a kind of once in a lifetime opportunity yeah. to get the sales up and and then it was i was i think myself and, and the whole team were just exhausted and i got a good offer to to buy the business and i, and I sold it because i i just knew that if i didn't get out now it was never going to i didn't think i could ever have made it bigger mm-hmm. and also, I didn't want that life. I didn't want to be working as much as that, to be honest. Um, so sold yeah. that in 2021 and, and just took a bit of time to say, okay, what, what do I actually want to do? And luckily, my my friend out here, a guy, Steve Lip, who's a, another guy, from, he's actually from Turriff, uh, but from the Northeast. So he's been out here for 20 years and, and started Alexander Murray & Co. Um, and got his first customer, I think, in 2004, maybe, uh, 2003, 2004. Yeah. I was looking for somebody to come in and, you know, help him run the business. And it was a, it was a great opportunity and it's, it's a great business. And, you know, it allows us, obviously allows me to come back to Scotland more often, as, as I was saying <laughs> earlier. And, you know, the, the deals are, are bigger, but there, there's not as many of them. So it's, it's a slower moving pace of business, which actually is far more compatible with a, a balanced life, which is what I'm kind of more intent on, on having these days. So. No, it's, it's worked out really well. And, you know, and we have our connection. We, you know, Alexander Murray uh, sponsor Good Onions Rugby Club. You know, we are the Jersey mm-hmm. sponsor. So it's a really nice connection. Mm-hmm. Steve had played for Good Onions back in the day. Obviously, my dad had played for Good Onions. So that's a really nice connection. And Steve and I are desperate to get back and get on one of the bus trips, actually, uh, next time they have, that we are back and they have an away game. So hopefully that'll happen. That sounds that sounds uh, ominous. That's all I'm saying. That sounds <laughs> ominous. And and te- and the business itself is it a bottling business, or is it an importer exporter, or what? What, is, what do you yeah. create blends and brands? How, what, what happens in there? Explain it to me, please. Yeah, we're we're a bit of both. So we're we're an independent bottler. Uh, we have our brand, the Alexander Murray brand. Mm-hmm. We sell that um, all over, but we have one big customer in Total Wine who 
we have a core range with that sells really well. And then we do a lot of mm-hmm. private labels. So we are the supplier for a few different kind of companies in America. So we do Costco, we do Trader Joe's, and we do Sam's Club. Um, we do mm-hmm. Scotch whiskey would be our, our bread and butter, but we do Irish whiskey and we've actually started doing Japanese whiskey a few years ago. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. So yeah, we, we have our own brands that we sell and then we do a lot of private label. And then the Alexander Murray brand would be our kind of traditional independent baller where we pick up batches of single malt from different distilleries and they're balled under the Alexander Murray name. But, you know, in some cases we can, we can name the distillery mm-hmm. and, you know, so if you, there's some less known distilleries that you know don't have their own bottlings and you can pick up you know a, whatever a, you know a milton duff or something that is perhaps harder to find elsewhere and you can you know, pick it up through us so yeah there's a, there's a few different things we do but it's it's mainly scotch whiskey and that's that's my passion that's i know that's what steve loves as well mm-hmm. so it's it's been a, a really good uh, journey for him and i'm kind of coming in and trying to take it on to the to the next step Fantastic. Remember to bring a bottle with you on that for that next Gordonian's bus trip. I'm not sure if I'll get on it because I'm not a Gordonian, but I might get a free pass out of my son. I'm not okay. sure. Chris, it's been great chatting to you. As always, we finish off with four quick fire questions, if you don't mind. Yeah. Um, and they all relate to you and the northeast of Scotland. So D-side or C-side? Oh, that's tough. Uh... Oh, I can't choose between that. I love Balmeri Beach, one of my favorite beaches in the world, and mm. I love Deeside. So I think I'm going to say both. <laughs> Perpignan, Peter Cooter. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope my mum won't get offended. She lives in Mill Timber, but uh, I actually love Perpignan. So uh, yeah, we'll go Perpignan on that one. Good memories from there. Good memories from there. Yeah, yeah, great place to play rugby. Like crazy mm. passionate fans and a brilliant 15,000 mm. seater stadium that was sold out every week and uh, we won the French top four team when I was there and it was just fantastic so yeah absolutely brilliant place to live I'm sure mum will forgive you a wee dram <laughs> or a shot of bourbon oh well a wee dram for sure I, you know I, I do love a wee dram I, I've gone into bourbon I've got to confess since I've been here but uh, yeah scotch is, is where my heart is Understood. And the last one, we ask everybody, buttery or fine piece? <laughs> you know what? I'm going to have to go buttery. Uh, I had a, I had a few, actually, last time I was back. I was back in March for a wee business trip, and my auntie, mm. my uncle eats them all the time, and my auntie had a few in, so I had a couple of butteries with uh, some strawberry jam and just kind of eat it. Fantastic. We we have to explain to people what butteries and fine pieces are offline when we, we do the segues in between. Chris uh-huh. Cusseter, it's been really great speaking to you. I've really enjoyed. We could go on a lot longer. The story's fantastic. But thank you very much for joining us and becoming an Inabooter. Yeah, thanks for having us. It's been a, been a pleasure.